This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Happy Sunday, everybody. It is uh, September 17th, about 9-something a.m. We got a service call for a walk-in freezer not working. You can clearly hear the hissing sound of the refrigerant flowing through the system. To me, it sounds like it's going to be low on charge, but, you know, who knows once I get up on the roof. But what's really concerning is that that panel's off. I had a discussion with the manager and told him, dude, stop trying to take things off. This guy likes to play with things and trying to fix it himself. I said, he goes, oh, I didn't do that. Someone must have hit it or something. I said, no, you, you someone opened that. You know, you got to stop that. Someone's going to get electrocuted. They don't seem to listen, but is what it is. Um, so let's hop up onto the roof because these evaporator fan motors are controlled from a, uh, a fan delay defrost termination switch that's inside the right side of that coil. And the evaporator coil has to get cold enough for the fans to turn on. So I can hear refrigerant flowing. So to me, just looking at it preliminarily, it seems like it's not getting cold enough. So let's hop up on the roof and see what we find. All right, the condensed unit's right here and it's short cycling. It's turning on and off. So I'm gonna take all the covers off and we'll get into it. All right, this guy is shutting off on low pressure. The sight glass is empty because I can barely see any vapor going through it. You can kind of see something moving around in there, just trace amounts of like oil refrigerant or something. Uh, it's about 67 degrees outside. See on that guy. And we are running low pressure. So I've already purged all my gauges. We're gonna go ahead and uh, once it starts running, I'm gonna go ahead and add some refrigerant to the system. This is a 404A system. So I got a drum of 404 right here. Let me verify I got the right one, yep. And we're just adding refrigerant. What's probably happening here, and we'll find out in a minute, we're watching it, we don't wanna flood this guy back, but I am feeding in through the, the suction filter. We're actually going through the accumulator first, so we have a little bit of safety protection there but I'm just adding some refrigerant. You can clearly see as I'm adding it, it's running now, okay, longer and longer. It's still gonna be low. So I'm gonna add some refrigerant, and then once I start seeing some action in the sight glass, I'll explain a little bit more of what is actually going on here. I added a little bit of refrigerant. The sight glass started to flash immediately once we got above about 180 PSI, which indicates that the head pressure control valve back there was bypassing. Um, it looks to be that we have a clear sight glass now. And it's consistently running. I'm also checking both sides of this suction line filter dryer. Uh, this is a filter dryer, not a suction line filter. There is a difference. I wanna make sure that this isn't restricted. So on one side, I have 26 PSI and dropping, okay? Let's go to the other side, see what's going on there. Make sure we don't have a restriction. I don't really think we have a restriction. It was dropping still, so we're 24.7, so I don't think there's a problem there. We now have a clear sight glass which indicates at this point in the system, we have a solid column of liquid, okay? But that doesn't mean that everything's hunky-dory, okay? There still could be problems. Notice that we're running 205 head pressure now. Um, I think that the evaporator fan motor's just turned on, judging by how my suction pressure went up. So we're actually absorbing heat from down inside the freezer now. So I think what happened here Realistically, I only added a couple pounds of gas. Total system charge on this is gonna be pretty high. You can see the last time we worked on it, we marked the liquid level, so I will check that in a minute. I think that we were just slightly low on refrigerant, just enough for the winter charge or the flooded charge, okay? Which is the extra refrigerant needed when the head pressure control valve bypasses. Now, we are having kind of like our first cool weekend, 68 degrees right now, like I said earlier, okay? and uh, that would allow for the head pressure control valve to bypass and then if it didn't have the right amount of refrigerant it would starve the system and like it was doing shut the system off on low pressure okay so i'm going to keep watching the system operate for a minute and then we'll do a pump down on the receiver and check the actual liquid level so the evaporator fan motors are running now 
Um, it's getting cold in here. So that's a good sign. I gotta go get my thermal imaging camera and we're gonna check that liquid level now. Something that I'm noticing too is that this thing's getting way too low before it shuts off. And look at the pressure control. Someone got in here and cranked on it. Look at this. I just tapped it. Someone doesn't know, I'm, I'm telling you, they play with things here. Someone got in here and adjusted on that pressure control way too low. So let's say that this system has a refrigerant leak in it, which we know it does because it's low on charge, right? So every time it runs, if that refrigerant leak happens to be on the low side of the system, every time it pumps down, it pulls a little bit of air into the system. Theoretically it could, and then that would be a problem. So this pressure control's out of whack. Look at 16 PSI. What the heck? It looks like it's adjusted for like five PSI or something. Something's going on here. Yeah, this thing's all wonky. Something's really screwy with this. Okay, so I pumped the system down, okay? I front seated the king valve. This is the only king valve on the system. This is on the outlet of the receiver, okay? Every other valve on a system is a service valve. This is a suction service valve. If there was a valve on the discharge line, like a rotolock valve, it would be a discharge service valve. If there's a valve on the inlet of the receiver, it's called a queen valve. So inlet of the receiver's queen valve, outlet of the receiver's king valve. If there's valves right here, those are service valves, okay? The only true king valve is the outlet of the receiver. All right, so I front seated the king valve, pushed the stem all the way in. Then what happened is, is the compressor continued to run and the refrigerant basically went through the compressor, through the condenser, but it couldn't leave the receiver. The receiver acts as a giant storage vessel. All that refrigerant backs up into the receiver until the system satisfies on low pressure, okay? Now that we know we have all the refrigerant trapped in the receiver, I'm gonna take a heat producing device and I'm gonna heat up the receiver, mild heat, okay? We're not gonna go crazy and then we're gonna look at it with the thermal imaging camera and see where our liquid level is. All right, if you look at the receiver right now, okay, I have it on like a hybrid view where you can see the actual shape of the receiver and not just the thermal. And you look, you can see the purple is gonna be cold and the orangish and the reddish color is gonna be warmer, okay? You can see the suction line filter dryer is pretty cold, the accumulator is pretty cold, and the compressor is cold up to the suction line, but then all of a sudden it gets warm, and you can see the crankcase heater is energized at the moment, okay? System just cycled because the pressure got high enough and it's gonna, it's just pumping down, it, the king valve's still closed. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a, a, a heat producing device and I'm gonna heat this guy up, all right? Now, if we look, the yellow's really hot, and as I scroll down, look towards the bottom of the receiver, and all of a sudden we turn purple at the bottom of it. Okay, the liquid level is right there where that purple line is. Okay, the top is vapor. We need the liquid level all the way up to the top. So this guy's severely low on refrigerant, so I gotta add a bunch of refrigerant to this guy. That liquid level, you can also feel it with your hand, is literally right here. Right there is our liquid level. And this is the pumped down level that we left it on 126.22, was all the way up here. So we've leaked out a significant amount of refrigerant. Now. It doesn't necessarily need all that refrigerant at the moment. It's only 70 degrees. To be honest with you, the head pressure control valve is not bypassing at 70 degrees. I, can't, I probably should have said that earlier. It was colder last night. It's warming up. as the, So it probably got down to like 60, 64 degrees, something like that last night. And that was probably enough for the head pressure control valve to bypass. And then it didn't have the required refrigerant it needed. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add refrigerant. Now this doesn't need all this because I cleared the sight glass at this temperature, right? So when I clear the sight glass at the temperature it is outside right now, that's enough refrigerant for this temperature, but anything below that, potentially, the head pressure control valve would require more refrigerant for the system to operate properly, if that makes sense, okay? The colder it gets, the more refrigerant you need for the flooded charge. So, we are gonna go ahead and top off the charge. Now, this to this, this level right here is not necessarily 
the amount of refrigerant this system needs to operate in the lowest ambient conditions. But when you're a field tech and you're out in the field, honestly, it's the easiest and the fastest way is just put the maximum amount of refrigerant in the system. But you gotta be careful because sometimes there could be drastically oversized receivers and adding to the three quarter level of the receiver when it's pumped down, you could theoretically put 20, 30, 40 extra pounds depending on the size of the receiver that it doesn't really need, right? In this situation, it's gonna be a couple pounds. It's gonna cost the customer less money for me to put that refrigerant level up to the three quarter mark. I get to go home, we'll come back on another day and come and try to find the leak when we're not on overtime because I'd rather be sitting down with my family on a Sunday morning than staring here trying to find a refrigerant leak. So I'm gonna go ahead and add some refrigerant to the system. Another trick, very carefully, and I mean very carefully, I'm gonna go ahead and leave the system pumped down and add refrigerant to it with the system uh, basically pumped down so it's just stacking in the receiver. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of refrigerant, get the pressure control to kick on, and then once it kicks on, uh, I'll try to get it to kick on here in just a sec. Uh, once it kicks on, then I'll just continue to add refrigerant and it'll just continue stacking in the receiver. But again, you gotta be very, very careful because you could flood back on this compressor. Notice that I switched my uh, pressure port to the other side of the suction line filter dryer. So I have that much more added protection. It's gonna go into the dryer, through the dryer, into the accumulator, into the compressor. So there's less potential of flood back when the system's pumped down like it is because the only refrigerant it's really getting is liquid refrigerant, right? But I am going through a Schrader too, and I'm metering it slowly. All right, so now we're just slowly adding refrigerant. It's just saving us a couple minutes of having to pump it down again. And I'm just gonna add it slowly, and then I'll check the liquid level periodically and then proceed until I get the liquid level to where I want it. I was actually having a problem with these Schraders. They're like restricting the flow of refrigerant for some reason, I don't know what's going on. So I switched over to the suction line service valve, but I gotta be really careful now because I don't have an accumulator to protect me anymore. So I just gotta be careful charging it. But on the plus side, I did make a slight adjustment to the pressure control and it's cutting out a little bit higher now. I need to make a slight adjustment though because it's a little bit high. It cut out at about 15 PSI. So I'll make a little bit more of an adjustment, get it a little bit lower. But yeah, this thing's out of whack though because it doesn't look like 15 where I have it set at. What can happen though, is this thing can just be slid the wrong direction, right? So this might need to slide down slightly. It looks like they have paint on there with the screw to indicate where it should be set at, but I think it's kind of out of whack. Fun stuff, right? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and put a little gas in there. It's turned on and I'll keep adding gas and I'll check the liquid level. The liquid level hadn't been moving, so that's why I was doing that. All right, and now if we look at it, the liquid level is right up at the three quarter mark. The, the scale is off on this guy a little bit, but the liquid level's now at the three quarter mark. You don't see the purple down there anymore. So we are good to go as far as our refrigerant charge. We now know that we have the maximum amount of refrigerant in the system. It's back up where it should be. And again, the scale's kind of off on that, but our liquid level's right there, so. Um, we're good to go on that. That's the maximum amount of refrigerant the system can hold. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and play with this pressure control a little bit more and then watch the box come down to temp a bit. See where I get it to cut in. I cut it out at about nine PSI. There we go. Yeah, okay, so pressure control is doing better now. You can see it shut off again at nine, but I just barely cracked the king valve. So now we're letting the refrigerant through for real and uh, yeah, something's definitely going on with that pressure control. I don't know what's, if it was someone playing with it or what, who knows. Um, so now I'm opening the king valve all the way because we don't have any gauges attached to it. We'll put the cap on it and we're gonna watch the system operate and watch the box come down to temp. I'm gonna go downstairs and put a little bit of uh, effort into just looking for a giant leak. I'm not gonna spend all day here on, on a Sunday. I'm just looking for anything giant and if I don't find anything, then we're gonna come back during the week and do a proper leak search and then give them a full evaluation on the system. The way that I operate is, is if I can get away with it, I'm not gonna have myself or my employees spending an entire day on a Sunday trying to find something, especially for customers that don't do routine maintenance. They're, they're just getting a get up and running, get them through the weekend, and we'll come back on straight time when it's not just about money to me. I mean, if my employees want to spend the Sunday here, I don't care, but I don't, you know, I'd rather be at home. I went ahead and ran my leak detector 
in all the common spots in the pressure control on the old pressure control that's not being used down in the evaporator i'm not finding anything on these service fittings right here nothing so it's not like a giant ginormous leak unless it's somewhere in the line set but i really don't think it is i think they just have a small leak somewhere so again we'll come back and we'll spend a little bit of time here um but it's not going to happen today so that is it for today the box is significantly colder and uh i'm gonna go ahead and wrap my stuff up all right i am back it's a normal day it is uh tuesday september 19th so we're gonna get into this and try to finish this one up a couple things that you didn't see on the last video number one i did have to put refrigerant into it so i'm gonna do a leak search on it i did talk to the customer and the customer is going to go ahead and opt to replace this equipment they are a very proactive customer at, at doing that and when we start to have a lot of problems depending on the age of the equipment they like to go ahead and replace it this is an original condensed unit probably i'm guessing 06 07 2007 is the original install date and uh they've been replacing it all now i'm not a huge fan you know they don't go with the, as high quality of equipment putting as the replacements but it is what it is but bottom line i still have to get the equipment operational and make it last until they get replacement equipment which might be a month or so it just depends on what the availability is now i know i can certainly get equipment sooner but this has to go through like a po process and it has nothing to do with me the customer purchases their own equipment it takes a while so but what i have to do today is i have to make sure that we are operational until they potentially get new replacement equipment so we're going to do a leak search on the equipment make sure there's no ginormous leaks uh, that are going to leak out in a day or anything like that then uh, they also have a twist timer downstairs that uh, acts as an off cycle timer for when they open the doors basically they're supposed to turn it it's a spring wound 15 minute timer that interrupts the power to the solenoid valve it break, basically breaks the common leg and then uh, you know after 15 minutes it automatically turns the solenoid valve back out on allows the system it's not just the solenoid valve actually I shouldn't say that it breaks the common to the evaporator coil and that eliminates everything that's 208 volt in the evaporator coil essentially breaks a leg of it so um, that twist timer is bad they also need door hinges on their door um, I don't have door hinges with me but I do have the twist timer I carry them in my truck uh, for those that are interested it's not a standard timer you can get at Home Depot it's made by Intermatic it looks like a standard timer part number FF315 Mary it's a uh, double pull double throw so it has the ability to open or close a circuit when you turn it and it's 15 minutes that's a difficult thing so you can buy the Intermatic timers at Home Depot but they're typically 60 minute timers so you have to order this uh, but again it's just a standard timer from Intermatic Oh, single pull double throw is what it is. I apologize. So anyways, I'm going to go downstairs. Uh, we're going to do another leak search on this. I did a quick one over the weekend, but nothing, you know, in depth. Uh, so I turned off the equipment on the roof and I'm going to go downstairs, change the twist timer. Then we'll turn the equipment back on and uh, let the pressures in the system equalize out between high side and low side. At the moment, it was pumped down when I walked up. That's another thing, too. If you're going to do a leak search on equipment, you got to make sure that it's in the operating position it can't be in a pumped down mode so as i was walking up to the roof the equipment was running and it cycled off on its own so that means that the solenoid valve downstairs closed if i tried to do a leak search when the solenoid valve was closed so if i just came up and turned off power and tried to leak search there's not very much pressure if any pressure at all 10 psi in the low side because it was pumped down so you want the system operating you want it running and if it's running, uh, you know, then when you shut it off, you'll have a little bit more pressure in the low side. Best case scenario, you put gauges on it and you equalize out the gauges. So you eat, you know, you uh, basically take the high side pressure, dump it into the low side pressure, then the system pressures on high and low side of the system would be equal and then do a leak search, okay? That's, that's a, a quick way to not have to pressurize the system with nitrogen because sometimes you know a simple leak search is a little difficult with lower pressures in the system if that makes sense but anyways now that i've talked forever let's go ahead and go downstairs and change this twist timer get this replaced and then we'll proceed with doing another leak search this is their timer right here it had a knob but i just pulled it off you can see there's like a lot of goo or calcium i don't know what that looks like goo or something behind there but 
what tends to happen on these is they get full of moisture. If you look at this, the insulation in the walls tends to have an issue. Now this is a bolt-on door right here, but you can see there's condensation all over everything. And uh, the cold air, oftentimes they'll prop these doors open. This one right here isn't shutting by itself. So look at this, let's see. That's another thing, see it needs door hinges because it's not shutting. So you'll get a lot of cold air and condensation will form and it tends to mess up these timers. So let's get it pulled out. And look at that. Look at the whole inside of that thing's all rusted out, full of moisture. That's pretty typical on these. So I'll get it off, get the new one installed. And if you, if you look back in here, it's not really in the box per se. It's more or less just on the front and it's just condensation building up from the cold air from the door being left open and stuff. So it happens and they're just saying that they'll come in here they'll notice the walk-in freezer fans aren't running and then they'll turn the timer and it just never turns itself back on all right i turned on power so the system's back on i kind of cheated because i pulled the wire from the uh contactor so that way it won't start from the coil voltage the system turned on i saw the sight glass uh refrigerant flow through the sight glass so we know that my evaporator coil is calling now okay at this point, I can go ahead and leak search the system. Now I'm gonna let it sit on for a few more minutes, make sure that the pressure's truly equalized out because instead of opening up my gauges, all that I did was open up the solenoid valve but made it so the compressor can't run. So the pressures are slowly equalizing from high side to low side. The refrigerant's flowing through the solenoid valve but it's not being pumped, it's just flowing through from the static pressure. So we're gonna let it sit for a few more minutes. I'm gonna get the leak detector warmed up and we're gonna start going through this condensing unit again and then we'll go down through the evaporators again. All right, so I've got my Inficon Stratus or DTEC Stratus out today. Um, I, I interchange between leak detectors. I carry the Fieldpiece DR82 and the Stratus, both of them. Both great leak detectors. So today I'm using the Stratus. And all I'm gonna do is just go around the mechanical fittings, the obvious places first. Um, looking at uh, listening to the leak detector because this one doesn't have a lighted tip like the field piece does but just listening paying attention one of the really important things you want to do if you can ever do it is leak searching where you put your service fittings first if you can leak search those because once you put gauges on a system you disturb that potential leak point you could sometimes solve a problem before you even you know realize it by putting gauges on a system or something maybe it's leaking out of Schrader so I always like to check any mechanical fittings I can, just kind of going around, and uh, we'll just keep on going through the system and I'll let you guys know if I find anything up here. I didn't find anything up in the condensing unit, no big signs, the pressure control's good. So I jumped down into the line set penetration, I'm not really picking anything up in here. It does go down into the, the attic there, but I just wanted to check up in this area, nothing. So now we head downstairs. All right, so this is actually the line set. Um, it's it's going to be difficult to change this line set, which I don't think we're going to have to, but I kind of did an inspection, a leak search on it all the way through, and I'm not seeing any leaks. So we're good on this, and we'll be able to use this for the new equipment. Tell you what, it's cold in here today. All right, so I work my way into here, and we're picking something up. I see like a slight bit of oil right in here. There was nothing big that I picked up. I kind of came through and looked the other day, but it might have just been that it was really low. We're picking something up right in this area. I suspect it's gonna be around the solenoid valve itself. Cause I'm sitting here looking, it doesn't look like it's coming from a weld. So let's get some uh, big blue soap bubbles on this bad boy. It's right in here on the solenoid valve. I've got uh, some big blue on there and it does a great job. It's basically, it's super small, but it's right on the underside right in here. There's a couple little leaks on the mechanical fitting. Um, I don't see anything on the stem just right in here it's really small so it's a very very slow slow leak so we're gonna put the coil back on get it back up and running and like I said the customer has already opted to go ahead and replace this equipment so this isn't gonna leak out overnight this is tiny they've already instructed me you know if it's something minor you know that'll get by just leave it alone that's what they want to do so we're going to uh, wrap this up get it back up and running and then uh, they'll order that equipment I'm curious, like, do you guys, when you go out on weekend service calls, I mean, are you just going to town fixing every single little thing or are you more or less getting them operational until you can come back during straight time? 
Um, I, I've always run it the way where I just get them operational. I mean, it's one thing if I got nothing else going on, sometimes I'll go to town and just get things done because I'm so busy. I don't have time to come back. That will happen occasionally in the summertime. Um, right now, you know, I'm not super slammed, so I don't mind coming back next week, you know, kind of a thing if I have to go out there on the weekend. Um, and the customer knows, you know, I tell them like, look, I'm not here to like, fix everything because they don't do routine maintenance. You know, that's the way I see it is it's one thing if they were a customer that did routine maintenance and had me out there servicing their equipment every single day, then I'd spend a little more time, but you know, they're not doing that. So it's like, no, they're not getting all my time on Sunday. So I usually go out, do what I have to do to get them operational and then we'll follow up, come back out. Now in this situation, I talked to the, the, the hierarchy of the company and you know, they basically said, Hey, um, do what you have to do to get it operational but we're going to go ahead and replace the equipment. So in this case, you know, it has a small leak. I got them going, um, you know, and then we'll just have to come back out and we'll replace the equipment. Now I did go through, I showed you guys a little bit, went through and like inspected the line set as best as possible to did a leak search on that. Uh, most of the time I'm not chasing leaks on line sets, but I just wanted to make sure, you know, uh, and that also tells me that I'll be able to use that existing line set when we replace the equipment too, because it's not in that bad of shape. So yeah, it is what it is. Hey, I want to say thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. You know, there's uh, there's quite a few of you that actually do that, and I thank you so very much. If you haven't already, please consider checking out my website, hvacrvideos.com. We have merchandise available. It's a great way to help support the channel. Hats, beanies, sweaters, all that good stuff. Um, I'm about to have a, a restock of hats, a few shirts and beanies and stuff. So if we are low, stay tuned. It'll be in soon. Um, there's a couple ways to support the channel if you're interested in doing so, but the easiest way is simply just watch the videos from beginning to end. That really is the easiest way. Um, if you want to support financially, uh, you can check out truetechtools.com if you're interested in purchasing any tools. They have a great selection. If you use my offer code Big Picture, you get a discount, an 8% discount on checkout. Now, there's a few items that doesn't apply to, but majority of them it does. When you use my discount code Big Picture, one word again, uh, I get a small commission. So it's a great way to help support the channel. And then there's also PayPal, Patreon, and YouTube channel memberships. Um, super thanks, which is a way like in the comments you can donate or whatever. Um, those are all different ways. There's links in the show notes. So thank you so very much. I really do appreciate you. And uh, we will catch you on the next one.